I'm not a fucking survivor. I fought every minute during cancer. I didn't lie under a table and survive the bombing. I was, you know, wearing great shoes and going to chemo. For my whole life, I've always figured out at a very young age that if I say I want to do something, I just do it. I make things happen. I'm going to move to Paris and go to design school. Okay, how are you going to do that? And I figure out a way. I moved to Austin. I said, I'm going to move to Austin. I found a job before I got here. I got the job, started working, and then I met Evan, and Evan said, let's get married and here's the space, have a store. And I'm like, this is what I've always wanted to do. And it was an outlet for where I could sell my own designs. It's like when we decided to have kids, it was just, okay, now we're gonna have children. There wasn't any, oh, this and that, and how are we gonna do it? Well, the doctor said you can't get pregnant. I was 45. We had to do actual IVF egg donor. We had to fly to New York. We had to, you know, we just kept finding solutions. And so then we got pregnant, like on the first try, and we got twins on the first try. And Evan hates expression, shit happens, because we don't believe that either. We believe in, um, just making things happen. I was born in New Jersey. I'm a total East Coast Yankee, and I love that. I was not the person dressing my Barbie dolls. I played in the dirt. I was a tomboy. I was an artist. That's what I wanted to do. My parents said no. I went to college, and I majored in French because I was good at it, and went to France for the first time when I was 15 and fell in love with it. And I got my master's degree in literature and I'm like, I'm gonna get my doctorate and be a French professor and wear great clothes. I was gonna be, you know, Gertrude Stein living <laughs> in my Rue de Fleurus uh, salon. It was the 80s and the 80s were really, really cool. And in Paris and I was like, I need to make these clothes that I want because I can't afford to buy them. And I can figure that out. I was very, I'm very logical. And then I discovered I loved it. And so I left teaching and enrolled in ESMA design school. One of my favorite designers is Yamamoto and he has the whole thing about blacks, whether you can stand out in a crowd or you can sink into anonymity. And of course I was in design school in the eighties. So he was my God. One day I saw him at Cafe Beaubourg after a show that we had gone to. And I was like, oh, I just, I'm not starstruck by people, but Yamamoto. <laughs> Marry me! <laughs> you know? I've never been a flashy dresser. My store is called Blackmail. I made it black. My whole closet, there's a whole row of black clothing. I got rid of color years ago because I wanted to talk about or feel, have the tactile and structural and texture, everything, all, every experience except the emotion of color. And now I have this amazing kid. She's blind, who's experiencing clothing the way I've always wanted to experience it. My pants are vintage Gautier, which makes me laugh. The high waist and the suspenders I adore. I was shopping with my kids and I was in Target and I was buying them shoes. And I tried on a pair of shoes and I'm like, these are so comfortable. And I dyed the heels and then I covered them in knotted linen. I usually wear layers, so the vest is me. I try to keep a piece from every collection. Every summer in Paris, I go to certain little hidden spots where they have couture remnants and I buy all they have. And this um, laser cut silk velvet, this little skull I got in California. And I love it because it's, I put on a little hand and then there's a little piece of braille on it that says my daughter's initial in Braille. <laughs> I have one friend in LA, he's like, get over the skull thing. And I'm like, no, nah, I just really like them. My pants are my own. I was in the fabric district with my children and I saw this and so I, I bought the whole bolt, which is something my husband teaches me. Don't go back, don't just buy two meters, don't just buy six meters, go and buy everything they have. My shoes. <laughs> This is my third pair of these shoes. They're Andamil Meester. I wore an undershirt. I never wore bras as a kid. And then when I had my breast taken off for a mastectomy for breast cancer, it looks great. So I wear them all the time. A little bit of that, you know, New Jersey Sopranos thing going on, which is okay. <laughs> I like stilettos. Probably one of the few things I do that's feminine. I mean, I didn't have my breast put back on, which um, for so many women that go through cancer, that's huge. Go back to the way you were, go back to being a woman, you know, and, and it's like, that doesn't make me a woman. This is my studio and my husband's studio. I call it my atelier. My husband is an amazing sign maker and he's had it for 17 years. I moved in a little over a year ago. We produce a line twice a year, putting carefully selected boutiques that will put up with me 
and my lack of reverence for what's considered the true fashion calendar that people adhere to because I don't like to play that. I can sit at my 1917 sewing machine when it's working and spend the whole day or days. I had the kids and they were born three months early. They were born with a congenital parasite called toxoplasmosis, which affects the brains and the eyes. And they were in the hospital for five and a half months and had four brain surgeries, 11 eye surgeries, heart surgeries. And I have these two amazing, magical children. First month, I didn't leave the house. I mean, literally, they took them out of me at 26 weeks. I just couldn't. I would go to the NICU every day and see them. They said our daughter would never speak, um, see, walk. And I mean, she'd walk in here right now and she'd be like, hi, how are you? What's your name? Nice to meet you. And give the biggest hug. When my kids would be sick when they were little, friends would be like, oh, my kid has a fever, but I can't tell you that because you've been through so much more. And I'm like, your fever is just as big to you as brain surgery is to me. What does that mean, normal? You know, well, I've had people like come up and like touch them and want to pray for them in the grocery store. I'm like, get your hands off my kids. There are two gypsy women that got on the metro and sat across from us. And Zelda likes to stand up when she's in the metro and she holds her cane and she feels the, the movement. The gypsy women kept looking at us and the one woman said to me in French, she said, um, what is that white stick that she has? And I said, you know, and I responded in French, I said, it's her long white cane and she's blind. And they said, she's, so she's non-voyante, she can't see anything. And I said, oh, she can see everything. And the woman smiled. She had these amazing gold teeth and she started smiling at Zelda and she asked if I could take off Zelda's sunglasses so she could see Zelda's eyes. And we took off the sunglasses and Zelda doesn't open her eyes that much, but when you tell Zelda to open her eyes, she goes like this. And she just, she just smiles. Her eyes remain closed, but she just beams this smile. And the woman just took her, Zelda's face in her hands, and the gypsy woman just said to her, said to me, she said, Madame, you know, your, your daughter is magic. She's a magical, magical child. And for somebody to think that Zelda's missing out on a huge part of life because she can't see, sure, I look at a tree and I say, I wish Zelda could see that. And I look at the tree and I say, I wish I could see it the way Zelda could see it. Everything was swimming along and I was designing more and more again. I was 50, I discovered a lump in my breast and I knew, I just knew it was cancer. I remember the doctor calling me, Evan walked in the door and I said, it's cancer, I have cancer. And, and I just broke down and cried and Evan just stood right here. I remember, didn't even come up to you right there. And he goes, okay, we're gonna do what we always do. We're gonna take care of this. <laughs> and I just said, yep. And I said, I can do this. I mean, my kids have been through so much more than I will even have to go through. I mean, I went through five surgeries. I went through you know, chemo, lost my hair and everything. And then a month later, my mother was diagnosed with cancer. And a month after that, my sister was diagnosed with cancer. We were in People Magazine. <laughs> I knew I was going to lose my hair and there was no ifs, ands, or buts. So we had a haircutting party. I freaked out when, because I knew my hair was going to fall out a week later and that's why I did it preemptively. Mm -hmm. And I just had little peach fuzz and I remember coming home from chemo and sitting on my couch and just scratching my head and the peach fuzz fell out. Again, it was one of those things like, <laughs> I'm doing it like this. I'm not going to let it just happen. The most vulnerable I think I've ever felt was um, two Christmases ago, we were in Telluride. We decided we were going to teach the kids to ski, and Zelda started to have a seizure. We carry what's called the magic bullet, which is her meds if she starts to seize, and it was at the house 20 minutes away right outside of town. It was probably the worst seizure that I've seen her have. I never, ever have felt like this is it. Like the whole time my kids were in the NICU when they were little, I never, I'm, that they would die never occurred to me. It didn't even enter my mind. It was like, we're just gonna get them better and bring them home. And that particular seizure um, stopped me. She wasn't seizing, but she was almost stopping. And that was probably the most vulnerable I've ever been. Um, because we've gone through lots of seizures. Went through seizures in Paris. I've been in the hospital there. And 
She's eight years old now, and I figured now that she can start to really express herself, from eight to 18, once a year I want to talk to her about what it's like as she realizes more and more about her blindness. And right now she's, I see everything, I see you, mommy. She knows our footsteps. She knows who's playing the radio within three notes. If I'll have a glass of wine after dinner, she'll come up and say, breathe on me, mommy. And she'll say, oh, you're drinking wine. Sometimes I'll get home at night and we'll walk in the door and I'll go to turn on the light. And I'll be like, I can do this. And I'll say to my husband, just pretend you're Zelda. Stop moaning and groaning, pretend you're Zelda. Walk through this dark room. The happiest moment of my life hasn't happened yet. They're all, see, I've had so much happiness. I'll be happy when my kids run in the door, give me a hug. I'll be happy when my husband and I sit down and can look each other in the eyes and have a glass of wine. You never know, it could just happen. <laughs> That's where the word happy comes from, happen. I think I would tell my 14 year old self, you're okay. You are okay, just the way you are. That's what I have to remind myself. That's what I have to remind my husband. That's what I have to remind my children. There's all kinds of things. Oh, it's going to get better, blah, 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 whatever. But you're okay.